Module 2, Tracing the American Automakers The automobile industry, like any thrilling movie, has its share of blockbuster heroes, enigmatic lead actors, and unexpected plot twists. Among these legends, Walter Chrysler stands tall, quite like a sleek tower in the cityscape of car-making history. Let's rev our engines and take a ride through the captivating lanes of Chrysler's rise, because trust me, it's a journey worth every mile. Walter Chrysler, more than just a name on the grill. Before he was the Chrysler, Walter was a man with a vision in the locomotive industry. Who would have thought? But life's like that, one minute you're working on trains and the next you're reshaping the entire automotive world. By the time he waved goodbye to the railroads, Walter had a reservoir of managerial and engineering knowledge. And where to pour it? Into the auto industry, of course. Now, Walter didn't just jump into the big leagues. His innings began with the rejuvenation of the Willys Overland Company and the Maxwell Motor Corporation. Imagine a seasoned chef turning bland dishes into gourmet meals, that's Walter for you. These successful turnarounds were just the pregame. In 1925, he founded the Chrysler Corporation, a name that would soon become synonymous with innovation and elegance. From one to many, the expansion extravaganza. One thing Walter knew, besides how to design a fantastic car, was that variety is the spice of life, and business. Instead of resting on the laurels of Chrysler's initial success, he decided, why not create a full banquet for the automotive world? Enter the divisions, Plymouth, Dodge, DeSoto, and Imperial. Each had its own flavor, catering to a unique clientele, but all bore the indelible stamp of Walter's leadership. It's not just about having a division for every day of the work week, it's about understanding the diverse dreams of drivers. While Plymouth brought reliable transportation to the masses, Imperial catered to the creme de la creme with unmatched luxury. Dodge? Well, that was for the adventurous souls, always ready to roar. And DeSoto was every bit the elegant charmer, turning heads wherever it went. Walter's strategy was crystal clear, dominate every segment, leave no road untraveled. The airflow adventure, a turbulent takeoff. Not every tale is about soaring highs, sometimes, there's a dip in the road. The Chrysler Airflow, although a masterpiece of engineering and aerodynamics, was, let's say, ahead of its time, or maybe just a little too different for its time. When unveiled, it seemed as if the future had arrived early. With a revolutionary design, integrated headlights, and that innovative grille, it was like a sci-fi novel on wheels. However, the public's reaction was a mixed bag of oh wow and um, what? While it had its share of admirers, many found the design too radical, too alien. It's like turning up to a 1920s jazz club in futuristic attire, cool but confusing. As a result, the airflow, despite its groundbreaking features, faced an early exit from the stage of popularity. The Zephyr's Gamble, Redesign or Retreat? After the airflow's turbulence, you'd think automakers would be wary of radical designs. But the Lincoln Zephyr's creators decided to roll the dice in 1938. Introducing headlights embedded in the fender? Check. The first ever horizontal grille? Double check. It was audacious, especially after witnessing the airflow's chilly reception. But sometimes, fortune favors the bold. In contrast to the airflow, the Zephyr's grill and design struck a chord with the audience. Instead of seeing it as an oddity, consumers embraced the change. It was as if the Zephyr whispered, change is here, and it's beautiful. And just like that, the face of the automobile was forever altered. Ford's Aging Struggles in the grand tapestry of the automobile industry, few threads are as striking as those woven by Henry Ford. As time went on, the tapestry began to show signs of wear and tear, primarily due to the inevitable aging of its primary weaver. Henry Ford's story is replete with genius-level innovation and, unfortunately, myopic management decisions, providing a rich case study on leadership in a rapidly evolving industry. Take, for instance, Ford's dramatic shutdown to transition from the T-model to the Model A. To many, this move seemed less of a well-orchestrated plan and more of a theatrical spectacle. Ford's T-Model, for all its revolutionary innovation, was starting to lose its shine in the market. Competitors were catching up, and the audience, eager for newness, was showing signs of restlessness. But, instead of a gradual phase-out, Ford hit the brakes, hard. Factories went silent, and an eerie calm ensued, only to be followed by the clamor of the Model A's birth. Was it a calculated risk? Or a whimsical decision of an aging titan? Many have pondered over it. While on the topic of control, it's hard to overlook the overbearing shadow of Harry Bennett in the Ford Empire. If there were ever a time to quote Spider-Man, it's now, with great power comes great responsibility. And, sadly, Bennett wasn't Peter Parker. Ford's increasing reliance on Bennett, a man who preferred fists over conversations, 
did more than ruffle feathers. Many in the corridors of Ford whispered about this growing influence, but very few dared to challenge it openly. But it wasn't all about power struggles and shutdowns. There were moments of clarity, where even in his advanced years, Ford allowed glimmers of progress. One such instance was when he allowed his son, Edsel, to work on the Mercury and Lincoln lines. These were not mere pet projects, but endeavors that showcased the potential for the Ford Motor Company's future. Edsel's hand on the wheel was smoother, subtler, and perhaps, a tad more aligned with the future than his father's. Now, shifting gears, let's discuss a bit about how Ford was influenced, or not, by others. When thinking of automotive success stories prior to Ford, Ransom Olds quickly comes to mind. Olds' vision of making cars accessible to the masses was an ideology Ford took to heart. Moreover, Olds showcased the marvel of enhancing production, though not as dramatically as Ford would later. In many ways, if Olds sowed the seeds, Ford was the one who nurtured it to become the forest we see today. Speaking of influences, the tale of Henry Ford and Frederick Winslow Taylor is a rather intriguing one. Taylor's principles of scientific management was, in many ways, the talk of the town. It proposed enhancing productivity by delving deep into details, something Ford seemed naturally inclined towards. But, and here's the twist, Ford never acknowledged Taylor. It's like enjoying an entire music concert and never clapping for the artist. Some argue Ford's approach was far more revolutionary, suggesting that Taylor, with all his theories, would have never invented the assembly line as he might have lacked Ford's gritty touch. Last, but by no means least, let's delve into Ford's wage philosophy. Henry was not just about making cars, he was about selling them too. And who better to buy those cars than the very people who made them? By advocating for rising wages and reducing prices, he wasn't just being a good Samaritan, he was cultivating a market for his products. It's a simple yet profound idea, empower your employees, and they'll drive your business, quite literally. Auto Workers Union History Ah, cars. America's sweetheart since Henry Ford's Model T rolled off the assembly line. But behind those gleaming bumpers and purring engines, there's a tumultuous story of labor strife, unity, resilience, and adaptation. Buckle up, reader. We're taking a trip down the memory lane of auto workers' unions. Jolted into action, the 1930s. You might recall the Great Depression, right? Not a fun time for anyone, let alone the auto industry. The Depression of 1920 to 1921? Well, that was the tough older sibling of the Great Depression. Its devastation was equally daunting for car manufacturers. Then there was the mounting challenge of competing with Ford's production capabilities. Competing with the behemoth was like trying to win a footrace against Usain Bolt with a pair of tied shoelaces. The 1930s weren't just about economic downturns. It was a pivotal decade for the nascent United Auto Workers, UAW. Workers often faced brutal conditions, scanty wages, and the ever-looming threat of unemployment. What could they possibly do? Unionize. One of the most traumatic events during this time was the Battle of the Overpass in 1937. It wasn't a medieval joust, but a violent confrontation between UAW organizers and Ford's security men. But the workers weren't deterred, their resolve only strengthened. By the end of the decade, the UAW had successfully organized General Motors and Chrysler, paving the way for better wages and working conditions. Victory. Post-World War II, Rumbles and Roars. Now, you might think World War II had an adverse impact on U.S. automakers, but think again. The industry actually got a boost. Car factories were repurposed for wartime production, and after the war, there was a pent-up demand for cars. But prosperity didn't mean peace. In the late 1940s, workers wanted a bigger piece of the burgeoning automotive pie. A major strike in 1945-46 rocked General Motors, but the result was a monumental contract that set the gold standard for worker benefits and wages. And speaking of the late 1940s, if you were looking to spruce up a film set with cars from that era, Hudson would be your go-to brand. Pierce Arrow and Daria? They were already memories by then. Golden Age, the 1970s. Ah, the 1970s. The era of disco, bell bottoms, and peak UAW. Membership reached an all-time high, and contracts negotiated during this decade were the stuff of legends. Workers enjoyed robust benefits, job security, and handsome wages. But, as with all golden eras, there were critics. Some argued that the generous contracts of the 1970s contributed to inflation and even laid the groundwork for financial woes for the big three, GM, Ford, and Chrysler, in subsequent years. Was the UAW dancing too close to the edge? Era of givebacks and rethinking relations. After dancing in the sun, the 1980s saw clouds on the horizon. 
As the big three faced increased competition from foreign car makers and mounting financial challenges, the UAW found itself in an unfamiliar position, making concessions. The era of givebacks had dawned. Many believed that the generous contracts of the 70s played a part in the automakers' challenges. However, it wasn't all gloom. This period also witnessed efforts to rebuild the labor management relationship. Joint programs aimed at improving quality, productivity, and worker involvement were launched, reflecting a spirit of collaboration.